we're going to go through here is um, um, I want to get the, the wording correct here. Um, and so this is the Can Africa Retail and Dispensary Training um, Labat Healthcare Observational Study Protocol Amendments. And this is an orientation session, part one. Um, uh, so thank you very much, Herschel, if you can, uh, if you can take us um, into the direction that you'd like us to go, please. Yeah, no, th th thank you very much, uh, James. The essentially, um, um, there's one thing that that we that I mentioned earlier when I had a discussion in preparation with James, and that was that if you look at the description of today's training session, including those other training sessions that we have attended thus far, you find that the description of our activity for the day is not something that you find um, uh, any other cannabis business in South Africa would be able to advertise and or schedule because we are the only business involved in the science of the plant to the extent that we're also interested in manufacturing finished products um, for the shelf, um, whether that be for the purposes of prescription, for medicines prescription, or whether that be um, uh, for the purposes of a retail um, uh, product. So you guys know my name is Social Master. You guys do know as per the document um, uh, that's on the screen at the moment, that I am the group executive for business development. Um, uh, and I work very closely, of course, with our team when it comes to product development and how it is that we usher this entire proposition of a seed bank, a cultivation grow facility, a, a extraction um, a business, a science and research company, an IP, intellectual property business, uh, as well as a retail can Africa consumer facing business. So the, the, the key thing here is that the protocol that we have available, and when I refer to the protocol, you guys know the research project that is currently underway uh, that includes our clinical research organization. It also includes our, our, our memorandum of understanding with uh, the CSIR for the purpose of, of narcotic um, uh, research as we are going towards the space of having measurable precision medicines manufacturing. And in order to do that, you need to make a number of different observations, both in uh, dosage forms, how much of people are taking. In other words, it's an observational study, um, but observational and quantitative. In other words, we look at the, the, the things that you can count, you know, um, uh, how many um, of, of a particular or how much of a particular compound is applicable as far as the the efficacy, how well it works, the efficacy, um, uh, whether it is efficacious, how well it works. So we need to we make certain observations in that regard, and we have to make those observations for how strong a, a dose it should be for it to work well. It's a multi-center. In other words, it doesn't have a single point of departure um, with, with a single point of hypothesis. In other words, we don't think beforehand what the outcome will be. So it's a multi sensed kind of thing in the way that we remain open in the data that comes out is not always part of a data set that you anticipate, but the data that comes out will always be valuable for other purposes. It's a retrospective. In other words, when we, um, uh, and this is the new amended title, okay, when we are going to look at a retrospective cross-sectional perspective, then you look at something of, the, the, the observational study particularly is retrospective. In other words, people who have been using cannabis since the 18th of September 2018 for private use as per the private bill. And that's already now five years ago. This September, it will be five years, half a decade since when the um, cannabis for private use has been legal in South Africa. And therefore, it's possible that when we do our research, that we are able to do research and we can onboard people who's been smoking cannabis for five years. And of course, it is five years or longer, but uh, we say five years because that's the sense when it was legal to consume and to possess uh, and to grow cannabis for private use. Um, so it's a retrospective cross-sectional, retrospective, right? Um, um, and the prospective study that, in, that is now backward-looking, forward-looking, 
It's multi-centered. We're looking at the values and we make an observation of the whole. Um, uh, that's the end of the study. So this study then, why do we want to do it observationally and look at quantities with different kind of points of center and the angle perspective? It is to examine everything, the mindset of people. So you're examining the attitudes. Like some of you will know, especially the the, the, the staff from Boxburg and the staff from a Boardwalk and the staff from the Greenacres and the staff from Benmore Gardens and other places, you'll find that they've been visited by your South African police services and or visited by SAPRA questioning certain things related to, to the availability of THC but as we dispose of our standard operating procedure of how it is that we actually dispense um, uh, THC. So the attitude of these people you will note, and the, and the police officer, for instance, only knows all of that police officer's life. That police officer only knows how it is to relate to something that's in the Narcotics Act, and he treats it, and his attitude is exactly the same as it would be if it was heroin. Or, or opium, um, uh, but behind that better, um, uh, or or anything else that is in 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 the space of uh, of the Narcotics Act. Um, uh, I do have some some uh, some key points I want to deliver, particularly in, in this regard. Um, but, and I'm just looking at my phone because I'm, I'm talking to the people at Boardwalk at the moment, where Sapra is currently present regarding this. So for the first for the first part. I wanted to, uh, James, to very, very quickly, um, uh, this is the final document for my colleagues, the whole schedule of events that we're putting in here. In other words, since the beginning, when we started, what is it that um, uh, we've been busy with thus far? I see, James, you did make me the the um, the host Thank for the meeting. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do with you now, James, is I shall... I have this document ready so I can share my screen and then and just go. Yeah, and if you don't mind with the draft protocol, if you can just read the deal with this issue of understanding place perspective, why are we doing it? Yes. Filling in knowledge gaps. Everything's and if you don't mind going through this section now. 100%. Um, uh, and then just talk about the kind of literature that's important in the same principle in a very, very kind of casual way. This is an orientation, okay, from everyone. It's an orientation, in other words, this is an orientation to let you know that this document actually exists and it's the upgrade of our protocol document. But most importantly is that we are also hiring 150 people at the moment um, as we are widening, deepening our, our supply chains into, into our, our retail um, business. Um, we will have people qualified over the next nine months um, and 12 months who's going to be going into the even the illicit dispensary space and, and offer themselves as resources. And in so doing, this particular approach and that messaging of Can Africa infiltrates a consumer-facing cannabis industry um, holistically. Because you are by far the most exposed and trained individuals when it comes to cannabis enterprising in South Africa, cannabis commercial analyzing in South Africa and cannabis private use in South Africa. So always see if you can, if you're that way inclined, always see yourself as an ambassador and a representative of this rather significant body of knowledge um, uh, um, that's in this business. Um, uh, we are certainly leading from the front. We are talking daily to your regulatory authorities. Um, uh, so in that regard, I want to just quickly to, to share on his screen whilst I take care of uh, James being the the host. There we go. Um, I have it. I have it up. I'm sure that everyone can see. Okay, James. I need, I need you guys to excuse me just for a few seconds while I make a call. No problem at all. So thank you very much, Herschel. Um, so I'm going to go through with you quickly the background information and the rationale. Um, and the introduction um, to this observational study is to explore the knowledge, perception and practices for cannabis use for medical or other reasons by exploring the, the following. Um, and so we want to be understanding of the patient perspectives 
Um, it's an observational study that allows for the collection of real world data directly from individuals who have used cannabis for medical or other purposes. Um, by exploring their knowledge, their perception and practices, we can gain valuable insights into their experiences, uh, their preferences and their attitudes towards cannabis use. Um, it's also going to be filling gaps, um, filling knowledge gaps. And so despite the growing acceptance and legalization of cannabis for medical use in many regions, um, there is still a lack of comprehensive information on the knowledge and practices associated with its use. And so this study aims to bridge this knowledge gap by providing a comprehensive assessment of the current attitudes, perception, and practices of cannabis use. Um, this is also evidence-based decision-making, and this policy decisions regarding the regulation, the accessibility, and education surrounding cannabis use should be informed by reliable and evidence-based data. And it's an observational study that can provide important insights that can contribute to the development of informed policies and guidelines. And this is done by improving patient care and understanding the attitudes, knowledge, perception, and practices of individuals using cannabis can lead to the improve, improved patient care. It can help healthcare providers better understand patient needs and tailor their approaches to treatment and provide accurate information regarding the risks, the benefits, and the potential interactions associated with cannabis use. Um, point five is identifying the educational needs. And so this study can identify gaps in knowledge and areas where further education and awareness campaigns are necessary. And this is by identifying misconceptions of areas of concern and targeted educational interventions can be developed to promote safe and responsible cannabis use. The protocol goes on um, informing research um, priorities and the findings from this observational study can help identify um, research priorities for future studies related to cannabis use. It can highlight areas that require further in investigation, such as specific medical con con conditions, um, and dosing regimes um, of potential adverse effects. And um, so we're basically what we're looking to do here is um, we want to find the cannabinoid profile that is suitable to an ailment or a medical condition. Um, we want to also be promoting public health and with the uh, increasing popularity of cannabis use for various reasons, it is important to ensure public health and safety. And by understanding the knowledge, the perception, and practices of cannabis use, interventions can be developed to promote a responsible use. And this by, this by doing responsible use, this will minimize the risks and provide appropriate support and resources. And so conducting an observational study to explore the knowledge, perception, and practices of cannabis um, for medical use or other reasons is crucial to gain a comprehensive understanding of patient experiences. And then this will inform um, evidence-based decision-making, which will improve patient care, identify educational needs, and guide research priorities to promote public health. Um, you know, there's relevant literature and data, and the, the literature available on the use of cannabis for medical or other reasons is extensive and continuously expanding. And here are some key areas and topics covered in the relative relevant literature. Um, so when it comes to medical conditions, there is a significant body of research exploring the therapeutic potential of cannabis for various medical conditions. Um, studies have focused on conditions such as chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, and cancer-related systems, symptoms. There's HIV AIDS, Crohn's disease, and psychiatric disorders like anxiety and insomnia. These are just a few of the medical conditions um, that are going to be expanded on, um, but everybody can relate to these, and that's why we make mention of them. 
Um, we also want to make mention of cannabinoids and the mechanisms of action. And so the literature investigates the pharmacology and mechanisms of action of cannabinoids. The active, these cannabinoids are the active compounds found in cannabis. Um, it explores um, it explores how cannabinoids interact with the endocannabinoid system in the body, which plays a crucial role in regulating physiological processes and modulating pain, inflammation, and other functions. We all know that um, uh, the, the pain and inflammation are very, very, very closely associated, and generally by reducing the inflammation, that's going to also give us um, increased efficacy for the management of pain. And then um, the efficacy and safety. Um, the research has examined the efficacy and safety profiles of cannabis-based treatments. Um, and this is through clinical trials, um, uh, systematic reviews, and meta-analysis that have assessed the effectiveness of cannabis for specific conditions and examining the outcomes such as symptom relief and quality of life improvements and adverse events. Um, uh, if we look at point number four, we come to the, the cannabinoid formulations. And so the literature here covers various formulations of cannabis and cannabinoids, um, including smoked or vaporized cannabis, um, an oral capsule, sublingual sprays. So sublingual is taken under the tongue. Um, uh, topical preparations. Topical is when we apply to the skin, the, the skin is the largest organ of the body. And so the bioavailability is, is massively increased. Um, and we're also looking at pharmaceutical grade cannabinoid extracts. Studies compare different delivery methods, dosages and formulations to assess their effectiveness and patient preferences. We look at the, the legal and regulatory frameworks and so given the evolving legal landscape, um, which is the you know, point in, in, in um, a very pertinent point at the moment. So the legal and regula le regulatory frameworks. And so given the evolving legal landscape surrounding cannabis, literature examines the legal and regulatory frameworks in different jurisdictions, including the status of medical cannabis programs, access and distribution models, patient registration processes, and safety regulations. Um, the patient perspectives and attitudes. And so we need to be understanding of what these patient perspectives, um, and this is a crucial part. And this literature includes surveys, qualitative studies, and observational research that explore patients' attitudes, perceptions, and experiences with medical cannabis. These studies delve into factors influencing patient decision-making, the perceived benefits, any concerns, and the barriers to access. Um, moving on to public health and policy implications. And so this literature addresses public health implications, including the impact of cannabis use on mental health, substance use disorders, um, whether there's driving impairment, um, uh, workplace safety, and youth consumption. It also examines policy considerations related to medical cannabis, such as regulatory frameworks, quality control, product labeling, and education campaigns. Um, uh, point eight is uh, cannabis and other substances. And so some research investigates the potential interactions and co-use of cannabis with other medications, including prescription drugs and substances like alcohol and opioids. Understanding these interactions helps identify potential risks and optimize patient safety. We also wanna know about long-term effects and adverse events. Um, as, a cannabis, as cannabis use becomes more prevalent, there's growing interest in studying the long-term effects and potential adverse events associated with its use. And research explores cognitive function, respiratory health, cardiovascular risks, dependency, and addiction potential. And the literature of cannabis for medical or other reasons is multidisciplinary. 
encompassing fields such as pharmacology, clinical medicine, psychology, public health, and social sciences. And it's very much important that ongoing research aims to address gaps in knowledge, refine treatment protocols, inform policy decisions, and provide evidence-based guidelines for the safe and effective use of cannabis. Um, uh, then we will move yeah. on to the, um, thank you, Herschel. Yes, no, th thank you very much, James. I probably have to um, uh, share the document myself again in order for us to- I will stop share. There you go. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, th thanks, James. So, you know, uh, my colleagues, um, uh, everyone, this is the- the one way that we have to orientate you and make you aware of what is going on in the research side. This session, as I indicated earlier, is an orientation session, that is part one. But the idea really is for you after the next three weeks, this week, next week, and the week thereafter, for you to be um, uh, relatively familiar with the content of this document uh, in the way that you can grow your own knowledge and understanding in uh, in the sector, and particularly for 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 this industry, there are different uh, kind of conditions that are applicable. You know, you don't just decide one day you can do research, and then the research going to be um, based on certain findings that you have predetermined, and then now you can give people opium and you can give them cocaine. I mean, it just doesn't quite work like that. However, I make reference to those because it's exactly the same way the law would look at a particular narcotic that is scheduled around Schedule 6 and Schedule 7, like all the other opioids, for instance. So there's a good clinical practice. And there's a good clinical practice. Uh, these are key words uh, that, uh, I, in fact, this is one of the, the, the phrases that I've included in a summative assessment, which could be completely, of course, voluntarily participated into by yourself. But if you do, I'm going to go through the, the, the handouts that we are making available, and we'll also have one or two refresher sessions. I'm hoping that by the end of this calendar year, the attendance and or, because you will get some certification for attending a mother's training by metric and by date, I mean, and by indication of the themes that were covered um, during that training. Um, but also, you will receive competence-based assessments if you want to do the multiple choice um, uh, examinations that will be online. Uh, by the end of, of August, we'll have one, and then again, also by the end of November. Nonetheless, there are certain international good clinical practices that you have to adhere to, and our um, a clinical trial um, a princ principal investigator is the name of Dr. Valhase, Dr. Uh, uh, I'm a, I can't remember first name now, I can't believe it, but I think it's Edith um, uh, Valhase. Um, uh, Agatha, Dr. Agatha Velasco, sorry, that uh, is, our, is our principal investigator. And she's also one of the first female kind of identified clinical trial specialists in, in South Africa, but recognized, recognized by the Federal Drug Administration, the FDA of the United States. Um, so there are a number of different kind of details in this document. You haven't seen it before. I appreciate that. However, there are primary objectives. We're just looking at people's attitudes. We also just look at people's knowledge levels. We're looking at what kind of mindset, perception, what kind of optic does a person have, um, uh, understanding what the, the different rituals are. And when I say rituals, because there are just so many people I've just spoken with in the last while, in the last years, who come from a particular community of people and their relaxation, their relaxation uh, time and self-care time, the time for themselves, taking time out to relax, um, uh, includes after a long day repairing almost ritualistically um, uh, their dosage or their pre-roll or their joint, as, as it were. And these people from the observational study really, really offer a significant amount of information that they don't necessarily always know, but they do offer quite a bit because they're actually making inputs into anti-anxiety. Um, uh, very, very important. A lot of people don't know that most of recreational use is actually an anxiety, ADHD, um, a kind of related um, uh, mind activity, right? 
So, so, so what's important is that we understand practices of our people as well. So, but then the identifying barriers and facilitators, in other words, these things, not having the necessary support from your healthcare professionals, doctors who are necessarily um, ill-informed or doctors who are uneducated, right? Maybe a person who studied at an MBCHB curriculum did not have the inside of the curriculum, the knowledge, they didn't have the exposure academically, uh, not even the exposure that you are exposed to, You're not even the academic exposure that you have as any doctor seen um, in their life at university. This is now legal. This is becoming medicine. Um, a lot of people are against it. You know, a lot of people, you, and you must expect and anticipate the kind of harassment um, that has been underway in the last while. Um, especially because of the different understandings and individuals' attitudes and the knowledge and the perceptions that they have about it. So it's a systemic kind of a big um, uh, uh, a reality in our industry. The documentation that we have in place, though, overall, um, um, is, is really to find out how do we get the best optimized kind of support um, um, to the industry and how is it that we can shift that which is recreational, for which we are waiting the laws to to to, to be to be finalized. Um, uh, we are also looking, by the way, at, at uh, petitioning the constitutional court uh, in regard to the commercial aspects of the business. I say it; a lot of people will, will feel that it is not the audience. But I like everyone to be regarded as suitably um, um, uh, eligible to have this information. So we're going to be identifying different patterns of how people are using cannabis. So right now at the front end, you are receiving people, you are boarding people, and you guys are doing a very, very good job at, um, at that. Thank you very, very much. Things are consistently shifting and we're establishing our standard operating procedures more and more um, every week. And every month, additional stores come online. At the beginning, the 25th of this month, we're opening Pretoria West. And the 1st of July, we're opening Pretoria East and Centurion. Um, and that's an average will be the first time that we're opening three stores in one month. We've only done two stores in one month consistently since February every month. So you are on onboarding these people and you're asking them to fill in this form. This form um, uh, obviously looks one-dimensionally um, uh, the way that it is um, uh, uh, when you see the form. However, when you look at 1,000 and 2,000 of these um, doc documents, then you have like a group of 200 people within a particular age group. And the particular, that particular age group between ages of 25, female, white, from Port Elizabeth, you'll find that buys um, uh, or acquires, uh, uses, consumes cannabis, um, a sativa predominantly, um, uh, and about five to eight grams um, per week, you know? Uh, but this is very, very valuable kind of information when it comes to the research environment in the way that we explore the patient's reported outcomes. What does the patient say about it, um, how that is that they feel? And we'll bring legitimacy to these people or to the information and to the industry um, uh, um, uh, quite significantly when, uh, when questions need to be answered and information needs to be, needs to be sought. So... Don't be uh, uh, alarmed when you see the content of the document, um, uh, but it is necessary to for, for you to, to, to know about it. We are finalizing this document tonight and tomorrow, um, uh, so you'll be fair, fair with it. So yeah, you'll be familiar with it. The secondary objectives, you guys did know the primary objectives, just to go back to that one. The primary objectives of the study is to gain that comprehensive understanding of all the attitudes and the knowledge and the perceptions and the practices regarding medical use. That's Primarily what we want to find out. And, and of course, it will contribute to your evidence-based guidelines. You understand what that means? Because if, if if this stuff never existed as a medicine, and now you have to give people guidelines on it, based on what are you giving them guidelines? Based on the way that you used it, and the way that you heard from someone, or something that you read somewhere, um, uh, this is this is not, not the way that you dispense medicine. Um, so the guidelines we will develop um, from the evidence that we got from 100,000 people, um, a minimum. Um, uh, and so, so, so I need 100,000 
of the onboarding documentation that will be sorted out. But there's some stuff more in this document that you will see that I will somewhat rush through as well. Um, uh, these are really what these sessions are for. It's just to, for you to hear the sounds from the people involved, intrinsically involved in the business uh, for self-study that you will allocate. And we will also um, uh, uh, take care of the administration thereof for those people indicating interest in wanting to do the sum of multiple choice assessments to get qualifications and certificates certificates um, uh, for their training, for their continued prof proficiency. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, let me quickly sort out our primary objectives. I want to say something and then go to secondary objectives. So our primary objective is then to, to find to get the evidence and then to give guidelines to, to, to consumers or to patients based on this evidence. And the evidence, the evidence is based on um, uh, all the contributions made by these individuals and to inform, okay, before I get to that part, and this is important, you know, the when you are onboarding a, a customer, onboarding a patient, and then, uh, then you must always take into account that um, um, this person uh, is really a worthy contributor to the um, um, to the project, to your business, and therefore treat them as such, so that you know that they know that their attitude and knowledge and the perceptions that they have in their practices is really important. Versus taking that approach of no, if you sign this thing, you can get a THC. It's really, we genuinely don't just want to do that. It's really not in our interest. Um, uh, and in the three minutes, I'll quickly explain to you the remainder of the primary objectives and the secondary objectives of the study. And that's really for us then to inform the educational initiatives. Right now, we are talking to the University of Nelson Mandela Metropol Metropolitan University in PE, the, the Business School of Leadership, and we are developing education tools and education courses for South African police services, for doctors, for SAPRA, for the National Prosecuting Authority, for a lot of people in their own continued proficiency offered by the university. And the university will be using the lecturers from our business for that. Because we have to educate the lawmakers. You have to educate the, the prosecuting authority. You have to educate the magistrate's council. You have to educate the regulatory agencies um, uh, in your state and in your government or related um, agencies um, of government. Because this sounds always illegal. And then there are a number of secondary objectives um, that you want to achieve. So, um, I don't know, are we, do we um, proceed after these two minutes on another session until 4.30? And you will send your details, or how does this work? No, no, we. I mean, it's a forty-minute session, and so um, uh, we'll we will continue next week. Oh, all right. No, so, 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 what I will do is then in the. Um, uh, I think it's actually really, really worth it. If you look at this document, for instance, I'll just quickly go to some sections and use that time. I'll Thank try you. and say I envisage we envisage that the study will continue for three years. We have determined this now. Yeah. We'll do it for three years, even though. The recruitment period, just recruiting people will be for a one full year, or if we are able to enroll 100,000 people. Um, um, and it will be read also by, by, by a mobile app. And you, the, the, you guys have been through the one session with James, where he shared with you about how the mobile app will work. Um, uh, and the app description is also there in this document. The easy registration process, all is going to be online. The informed consent, the user guidance, the app security and data privacy, clear communication channels, notifications and reminders. This is all the stuff that we've briefed our clinical research organization on for us to be able to achieve in the short term. Our recruitment strategy is clear. It runs alongside our hiring strategy of people as well. Um, uh, but you will receive this document for your purposes, okay, of self-study. Go through it. Nobody will ever be able to compare to you and compare with you anywhere in Africa or the southern hemisphere of this world when it comes to a, a retail consumer-facing business and have this kind of content. So next week, we'll talk about the study population and we'll talk a little bit about the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria, and then we're going to take it further from there. Thank you so much, James. Thank you very much for setting up the session. Um, I'm a, I'm also on the education group, so I'm looking forward to receiving some uh, some messages there or anything that people want to know. I mean, we can take it forth from them. Thank, thank you very much, Chad.
thank you so much. Um, uh, um, uh, very, very nice having you and um, uh, your 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 very strong um, uh, mind and uh, you know the direction that um, uh, that we're heading is uh, under your leadership is um, uh, extremely exciting. So thank you very much. Um, uh, so the guys, that's going to bring us to the end of session thirteen. This is going to be uploaded onto YouTube um, under the Can Africa Training Academy. Um, and so thank you for all that attended and um, look forward to, to continuing with you next week.